Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor for me to greet everybody who has come here for this meeting, this uh, Spring School, San Rafael Spring School of Philosophy, uh, which this year, 2014, uh, has for a title Naturalism, the First Person Perspective and Embodied Mind. Uh, this conference was organized by the whole faculty of philosophy of uh, San Rafael University, but uh, you know, many, many of you know that this is not the first spring school uh, that was uh, held here. Um, I think this is the third, actually. Yes. It is the third spring, spring school. The first two spring schools were organized in the past years uh, by uh, the Center for the Studies about the person. It is a long title. For Center for Long Phenomenological Studies about the person. Uh, the Centro Persona, as we call it, uh, whose director is Professoressa Roberta de Monticelli. He's, everybody knows her, I think. She's right here in the first row. And uh, uh, so she has had the idea of organizing first, three, three years ago, a spring school, especially for PhD students, but for all kind of students and for scholars. And uh, thanks to her efforts, to her uh, um, undomable, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to translate, she can not be done, done. She, we can't control her. She, she's <laughs> unstoppable strength. We, we can't control what Roberta does, but in the end she always does very good things. So, so uh, the only way to, to have some kind of a control about, about what she was doing here in the spring schools was to uh, consider and to enter the program and consider the spring school as a, an, a, an enterprise for the whole, whole faculty. So uh, my greetings here are from the, all the students, all the scholars, all the teachers, all the faculty, uh, and uh, we do consider this conference uh, a moment in which at least once a year San Rafaele, uh, San Rafaele University and, and the faculty of philosophy in particular tries to gather people around here uh, to, to discuss with us uh, about uh, philosophy and about personal specific issues in philosophy. So, for this reason, the organizers of the conference are at the four centers of this faculty of philosophy, which is, well, I just give summary names. Uh, apart, apart from the uh, Center for the Phenomenological Studies about the person, directed by uh, Roberto Monticelli. Uh, Co-organizers are the uh, Center for Research in, uh, in Applied and Experimental Epistemology, directed by Matteo Montellini. The Center for Studies in Public Ethics, directed by Roberta Sala. And the uh, Center for Research in uh, inter Interdisciplinary Research in the history of ideas, which is directed by Andrea Tagliapi. Uh, so, since every single teacher of the faculty belongs to at least one of these centers, the whole faculty is organizing the thing. So, the topic this year, uh, I have already said, is naturalism, the first person perspective and embodied mind. Probably some of you have noticed that uh, the logo of San Rafael University is taken from the uh, image of man, the Vitruvian image of man, and uh, the motto is Quid est homo, which is taken from uh, the psalm, the psalm number eight uh, in the Latin version. And the question is, Quid est homo is taken uh, to be a question for the three faculties of the university, medicine, psychology, and philosophy. The idea is that the question about man is a question about his health, about his mind, and about his culture. Yeah. <laughs> philosophy is, in a way, a way to summarize culture. So, uh, the person is the name and the concept which for many of us, not all of us maybe, but for many of us, the notion of a person is the notion which uh, 
summarizes altogether the different dimensions of the human being. Uh, I, I think that some of us would define themselves, me, me as well, uh, as personalists, although in a very different way, in a very different spirit than the personalist movements of the first half of the 20th century, but in a way, phenomenal, the phenomenological approaches what takes the person as the center of the uh, inquiry. I am Kantian, and I think that Kant is, in a way, a personalist thinker. And mm, we are glad to, to host people who uh, deals with the notion of person as a philosophical topic uh, in different traditions, from different points of view. For this reason, it is a great, great honor for me to, to host here today Professor Lynn Baker, Lynn Ruderbaker, from the University of Massachusetts at Armhurst, and uh, she will give the keynote address. And uh, as you uh, probably have noticed, uh, the title of the whole conference is based on the title of her last book. Uh, her last book is entitled Naturalism and the First Person Perspective. It's published by Oxford University Press in 2013. Uh, I think that uh, an Italian translation is forthcoming, but uh, we always try to find an author uh, it for, which is interesting for us, who has just published a book about uh, important issues in philosophy to, to give the main line of the topics and not the argument in these kinds of conferences. And uh, it was natural when, when, when your book was published, it was natural to think, well, Okay, this is a topic where we all are interested in, and it is an, an important book. It's a book to be discussed and to be uh, read widely uh, in Italy and abroad. So uh, it was natural for us to think about, to think, to uh, devote the, the whole conference uh, to the topic of the book. We have slightly changed the title of the conference now, just to leave the copyright to, <laughs> to be so to Professor Baker of Berber. So, uh, we will talk about naturalism, the first person, and the embodied mind. So, uh, and the format of the conference is that we have a keynote address by Professor Lynn Baker, and then we will have a, a discussion, straight away, directly on, on her talk, and then we'll have a coffee break, and uh, please, for the coffee break, follow the two persons who are organizing all this the tremendous uh, organization of, of the conference, who are Francesca Forlè and Sara Songuria. They are over there. Uh, they keep the, uh, the papers. So you entering the room, you should have received the, uh, the papers, uh, the, the, not just the handout, but all papers. And if you need a copy of it, just ask them. And when it, it's coffee break time, follow them. They will lead you uh, to find some rest, find some refreshments. And they also have uh, those, these small cards which you need in order to, uh, to take the coffee. Okay, so uh, just a few words again about, uh, about uh, Professor Lynn Baker. Uh, the last book is, a, is the one I already quoted, Naturalism in the First Person Perspective, uh, but I also want to quote, uh, to mention another book, uh, which was uh, in the title Persons and Bodies, and in Italian it was translated in 2007, with the title Persone e Corpi, un'alternativa al dualismo cartesiano e al riduzionismo animalista, an alternative to Cartesian dualism and to animalist reductionism and uh, I quote this book first of all because it's an incredibly interesting book I found that her line of argument is uh, absolutely convincing in terms of uh, how to understand person in a way which is not spiritualist is not uh, and it is not just uh, physicalist and the line of the argument uh, finds me really uh, agreeing to, to what she has argued and because the title of the talk that we are going to listen now 
is partially a quotation from this book as well, because the title of the talk of Professor uh, Baker is Cartesianism and the First Person Perspective. So uh, it is not just naturalism, but a special uh, uh, interpretation of what uh, naturalism may, may uh, mean in this perspective. So, uh, I think it's not necessary to, to, to introduce Professor Baker uh, more than this because well, she, uh, she teaches at the University of Massachusetts. She has published extensively, uh, not only books, but articles. Uh, she is an outstanding figure in, in the scholarship in philosophy. And I think we, we can just start now. We will have time until about uh, half past three or 20 past three. And then we will have at least 30 minutes of discussion, uh, and then we will ask the conference. So, Professor Baker, to you. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. You want to stand up? I think I will. Uh, thank you very much, Roberto, for that very generous introduction. Cartesianism and the first person perspective. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Not really. But I, I can tell about this. Questo è tutto esteso per cui così non può. Ok, try now. How's this? I'll, I'll talk over. Ok, how's this? Yeah. <laughs> ok. Cartesianism and the first person perspective. Rene Descartes has a good claim to be the originator of first person philosophy. Descartes' first person outlook permeates his philosophy. Indeed. Descartes begins his epistemological inquiries by examining his own beliefs to discover which ones might be false. Even today, Descartes' influence is so broad that it is often assumed that any philosopher who emphasizes the first-person perspective, as I do, must be a Cartesian. I want to challenge the assumption that I must be a Cartesian by setting out my own view of the first person perspective and its importance for being a person. Then I shall enumerate the ways in which my conception of the first person perspective differs from Descartes. Finally, I shall, I shall consider an alternative interpretation of Descartes according to which he was aiming at a wholly objective, absolute conception of reality. And I shall argue that such an absolute conception cannot be a full account of, re of reality. So on my view, a human person begins existence constituted by an organism, a human organism, but is not identical to the organism that constitutes her. For purposes of this paper, I shall leave aside the essential feature of, of an embodiment. What matters here is another essential property of persons, a first-person perspective. <coughs> a first-person perspective is a dispositional property. It's not like using Cartesian coordinates as opposed to polar coordinates. It is, it's a property, a dispositional property, like being honest. It's a dispositional property <clears throat> that members of the kind person have essentially. A first person perspective is a complex property that has two stages, a rudimentary stage that a person is born with and a robust stage that a person develops as she acquires language. At the rudimentary stage, a first person perspective is a non-conceptual capacity shared by human infants and non-human animals. It is the capacity of a conscious subject to perceive and interact with entities in the world from a first personal origin. At the robust stage of first person perspective is a conceptual capacity displayed by language users. It is the capacity to conceive of oneself as oneself from the first person without identifying oneself by a name, description, or any third personal demonstrative. <coughs> Born with a rudimentary first person perspective and a remote or second order capacity to develop a first person perspective, 
a human person gets to the robust stage in the natural course of, de of development. As she learns a language, a person acquires numerous concepts, among which is a self-concept that she can use to conceive of herself as herself in the first person. At the rudimentary stage, she can do things intentionally. At the robust stage, she can conceive of herself as doing things. At the rudimentary stage, she can perceive things in the world. At the robust stage, she can conceive of herself as perceiving things. Although the robust stage of the first person perspective requires language, it is exhibited throughout one's life in characteristically human activities, from making contracts to celebrating anniversaries to seeking fame by entering beauty contests. So a person with a robust first-person perspective can manifest her person personhood in a much richer and more variegated way than can an infant who has only a rudimentary first-person perspective. What makes you now, with your first-person perspective, the, the, the same person that you were as an infant with only a rudimentary first-person perspective is that there is a single exemplification of the dispositional property of having a first-person perspective, both then and now, regardless of the, of the vast differences in, the, in its manifestations over the years. For example, an infant may manifest a first-person perspective at the rudimentary stage by drawing back from a looming figure and an adult may manifest a first-person perspective at the robust stage by making a will. A human person from infancy through maturity until death, and perhaps beyond, is a single exemplifier of a first-person perspective, whether rudimentary or robust. Now in greater detail. Let's start with the rudimentary first-person perspective. The stage of the rudimentary first-person perspective is shared by humans and non-human animals. The rudimentary first-person perspective connects animals that constitute persons with other animals. A human infant is a person constituted by a human animal. An infant is, is born with minimal consciousness and intentionality, which are the ingredients of a rudimentary first-person perspective. A person comes into existence when a human organism develops to the point of being able to support a rudimentary first-person perspective, presumably during some late fetal stage. But nobody knows. There's not an exact moment, and nobody, and so there's no knowing of an exact moment when an or, when this organism becomes comes to constitute a person. The person constituted by the organism, the new entity in the world as a first-person perspective, essentially. The first-person perspective does not depend on linguistic or the rudimentary, excuse me, the rudimentary first-person perspective does not depend on linguistic or conceptual abilities. The rudimentary first-person perspective is found in many biological species, perhaps all mammals, and seems to be subject to gradation or degrees. Among species, consciousness and intentionality seem to dawn gradually from simpler organisms, and the rudimentary first-person perspective seems to become more fine-grained as it runs through many species in the animal kingdom. <coughs> Darwinism offers a great unifying thesis that there is one grand pattern of similarity linking all life. Considered in terms of genetic or mor morphological properties or biological function, there's no discontinuity between chimpanzees and human animals. In fact, human animals are biologically more closely related to certain kinds of chimpanzees than chimpanzees are related to gorillas and orangutans. Human infants, along with dogs, cows, horses, and other non-language-using uh, non mammals, also have rudimentary first-person perspectives. So my view recognizes the continuity between human animals that constitute human infants and higher non-human animals that constitute nothing. That's the cows and the horses. In this way, the biological continuity of the animal kingdom is unbroken. 
But wait, you may say. If that's so, why do you say, why do I say that you that a person is only constituted by an animal and not identical to an animal? For this reason, although there is no discontinuity in the animal world, no biological discontinuity, the evolution of human persons, perhaps by natural natural selection, does introduce an ontological discontinuity. The ontological discontinuity between persons and animals lies in the fact that a human infant who is not identical to an organism that constitutes her has a remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. A non-human organism that does not constitute a person may have a rudimentary first-person perspective, as its chimpanzees do, but it has no remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. And this remote capacity distinguishes persons from all other beings in the world. A, a remote capacity is a second-order capacity, a capacity to develop a capacity. For example, a he healthy human infant has a remote capacity to ride a bicycle. She doesn't yet have the capacity to ride, but she does have the capacity to acquire the capacity to ride a bicycle. <clears throat> when, the young, when the young child learns to ride a bicycle, she then acquires an in-hand capacity to ride a bicycle. That is, in certain circumstances, when she has a bicycle available and wants to ride, she actually rides a bicycle and manifests her capacity to ride a bicycle. She may never learn to ride a bike, in which case her remote capacity to ride a bicycle would not issue in an in-hand capacity to ride a bicycle. Similarly, even though a remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective is an essential property of persons, a person may never actually develop a robust perspective first-person perspective, if, for example, a person had a severe case of autism, very severe. The point is that an infant person is not only a, has not only a rudimentary first-person perspective, but also has a remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. Otherwise, the entity would not be a human person. So the ontological difference between persons and animals lies in the robust first-person perspective and in the remote capacity to develop one. In pre-linguistic per persons like babies, the, the rudimentary stage of the first-person perspective brings with it the remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. Non-human animals have no such remote capacity. So on one hand, I'm tying human beings, human, uh, human beings to animals in the animal kingdom. On the other hand, I'm saying human beings are ontologically unique. We are the only ones who develop and are born with a remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective, which we develop when we learn language. So what makes persons unique is that only persons have robust first-person perspectives. If dogs learned to talk and acquired the capacity to conceive of themselves in the first person, a new kind of entity would come into existence, canine persons. But the point would still hold. Only persons have robust first person perspectives. To sum up, the rudimentary stage of a first person perspective is a non-conceptual stage that entails consciousness and intentionality. The rudimentary stage is what ties us persons to the seamless animal kingdom. The robust stage is what makes us ontologically and morally unique. So now let's turn to what exactly a robust first-person perspective is. Unlike the rudimentary stage, which does not require language or concepts, the robust stage of the first-person perspective is a conceptual stage that entails the peculiar ability to conceive of oneself as oneself in the first person. Conclusive evidence of a robust first person perspective comes from use of complex first person sentences like, I wonder how I will die, or I promise that I will stay with you. If I wonder how I will die, or I promise that I will stay with you, then I'm thinking of myself as myself. 
I'm not thinking of, thinking of myself in any third person way, not as Lynn Baker, nor as that woman, nor as the only person in, standing in the room. Even if I had amnesia and didn't realize that I was Lynn Baker, I still could wonder how I'm going to die. Any entity that can wonder how she, she herself, will die, ipso facto has a robust first-person perspective and thus is a person. She can understand herself from within, so to speak. In order to have a robust first-person perspective, one must have a concept of oneself as oneself in the first person, a self-concept. The second occurrence of I, and I wonder how I'm going to die, expresses a self-concept. It is impossible that two people have the same self-concept. A self-concept cannot stand alone. It's a non-qualitative concept that, can, that is used only in tandem with other concepts. If I promise that I will take care of you, then I manifest a robust first-person perspective by expressing a self-concept. But I also manifest mastery of empirical concepts like promise and taking care. And it is in learning a natural language that one masters these other common empirical concepts that one joins to a self-concept. Hume was right, when, uh, occasionally he was right. He was right uh, that, that when I look inside myself, I always stumble over an, over an impression, or as I would say, a thought. But the moral to draw is that a self-concept cannot stand alone, but is always deployed jointly with other concepts. On my view, the robust first-person perspective is much more far-reaching than thinking about one's mental states or about oneself as the bearer of mental states. Applying for a job, making a contract, accepting an invitation all require a robust first-person perspective. If I wish that I were a movie star, I manifest a robust first-person perspective. But if I wish that L.B. Lynn Baker were a movie star, I do not manifest one. Even though I am Lynn Baker and I have a first-person perspective, it's not manifested by thinking, I wish Lynn Baker were a, first, were a movie star. Actually, I don't wish that at all. <laughs> There's an important, ineliminable contrast between my thinking about myself as myself in the first person, knowing that it is myself whom I am thinking about, and my thinking about someone who is in fact myself without realizing it. And this contrast cannot be made without a robust first-person perspective. To sum up my idea of the first-person perspective, whereas a rudimentary first-person perspective is shared by persons and certain non-human animals, a robust first-person perspective, the conceptual ability to think of oneself as oneself in the first person, is unique to persons. Human persons normally traverse a path from the rudimentary to the robust first-person perspective, from consciousness to self-consciousness. Now I want to explore some ways in which my conception of the first-person perspective differs from Descartes' own conception. One, Descartes allows for thinkers in isolation. Mine does not. Descartes envisioned the possibility that there existed a single person with the sophisticated ability to entertain thoughts and reason from them. For example, Descartes said, I seem to be sitting in front or something like this, I seem to be sitting in front of my fire in my dressing gown, but my senses have deceived me before, therefore they are deceived they might be deceiving me now. I do end quote. I do not want to challenge the validity of the argument or its premises, but rather insist that it is conceptually impossible, it is conceptually impossible for a solitary person to have such thoughts. I think your, 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 your text says possible. It's impossible for a solitary person to have such thoughts. If Descartes had been, been the only finite entity in the universe, he could not have entertained such thoughts. Why not? because he could not have acquired the concepts that are constituents of such thoughts. For example, fire, sitting in front of, the dress and dressing gown. If he didn't have a public language, he could not have had a public language with, he could not have had a public language if he did not have a public language. 
and could not have a have had and he could not he could not have have had a public language without a linguistic community. Master, I think that sentence is a little language on this. Mastering a language requires a linguistic community. Wittgenstein picked why one could not make up a language in isolation. If you did, then there would be no standards of correctness. If you categorized a new item that you took to be of a kind that you had named or identified before, there would be no difference between getting it right and getting it wrong. Wittgenstein averse, one would like to say whatever is going to seem right to me is right, and that only means that we cannot talk here about right. So whatever one did in isolation, it would not be to invent a language. So here's the first difference between my view and Descartes. On my view, there can be no thinkers without a linguistic community. Two, relatedly, Descartes thinkers are non-social entities. Mine are social entities. On Descartes' view, there could be, a, there could be isolated thinkers. According to mine, they are so, essentially social entities. As I argued earlier, robust first-person perspectives are what distinguish persons from everything else in the universe. Although not every person must have a robust first-person first perspective, every person must have at least a remote or second-order capacity for one. There, there could be no persons if there were no first-person perspectives. And since a, a robust first-person perspective requires having a language, and having a language requires that one is in a linguistic community, and a linguistic community is a social community, it follows that persons are as social entities, on my view, but not on Descartes. Three, Descartes appeals to a pure mind. I appeal to nothing but to embodied persons, to persons and the bodies that constitute them. Descartes thought that there was a pure mind, perhaps a center of, a, of an arena of consciousness, whereas on my view, there's no subpersonal mind, soul, or self. All my view requires are whole persons constituted by bodies. Persons, whole embodied persons, are the bearers of properties like anger, regret, belief, knowledge, seeing a parking place, feeling excited, and other so-called mental properties. Brains furnish the mechanisms that make the exemplification of these mental properties possible. In my opinion, any appeal to a mind, soul, or self is just gratuitous. Saul Kripke recounted a conversation he once had with a non-philosophical friend about Hume's misbegotten search for a self. His friend said, well, Hume must never have looked in a mirror. In a way, I agree with the friend. What you see in the mirror is as close to a self as you're going to get. Four. In the meditations, Descartes' aim was epistemological. What can I know with certainty? This tool was the method of doubt. Suspend judgment about any of your beliefs that could possibly be false until you get to beliefs, if any, that cannot possibly be doubted. Thus, Descartes is not only a foundationalist, but the foundation of knowledge is robustly first personal. Each of us is to inspect our own beliefs. For Descartes, what is discerned from the first-person perspective has epistemic primacy. One knows one's own mind better than one knows anything else and justifies her beliefs about her environment by inspecting her own mind. By contrast, my aim is ontological. What is ontologically required for reality to be as it is? I do not believe that there is any single rigorous method for finding out what is genuinely real. I do not believe that the first person perspective has epistemic primacy. I take that an object of kind K belongs in ontology if, one, objects of kind K are not reducible to objects of lower kinds, and two, if Elimination of objects of kind K renders the ontology incomplete. Let me explain. Artifacts like tables and chairs, bicycles and automobiles are neither reducible nor, inel or, nor eliminable from a complete description of reality. For example, a tractor, an artifact, cannot be reduced to objects of lower kinds. 
because something is attractive only in virtue of there being certain practices, purposes, and uses for the thing. Some tractor-like object that spontaneously coalesced in outer space would not be attractive, however much it resembled one. And the facts, the relevant facts about practices, purposes, and uses are not determined by any facts about objects of lower kinds than practice, steering wheels, tires, and so on. So artifacts are not reducible, nor are artifacts eliminable. If the ontology left out artifacts, it would not be a complete <coughs> description of reality. My method, such as it, as it is, for determining whether something is genuinely real and belongs in ontology is to determine whether it, it is irreducible and ineliminable. This method, unlike Descartes, is highly fallible. On my view, the first person confers no epistemic justificatory primacy. We needn't justify our beliefs about the ways that things are in terms of the ways that they seem or appear to us. Descartes thought, sought a level of reality that was wholly without presuppositions. I do not. On my view, there is always a plethora of presuppositions, many of which are clearly empirical. Six, Descartes was a dualist. There are two kinds of finite things, material thinking substances and uh, immaterial thinking substances and material extended substances, minds and bodies. On my view, there are countless kinds of things, primary kinds, from tomatoes to the to diplomas. Seven, a related difference, at least between my views and those of some of Descartes' descendants, is that on my view, many of the primary kinds of things are intention dependent. That is, they could not exist or occur in worlds in which there were no beings with intentions. Take a driver's license. These, these include all sorts of manufactured goods like vet clothes, knobs, and eyeglasses. Social objects like passports and credit cards exist even though their, their existence depends on our intentions and practices. From this fact, it follows that there would be distinction between things that are mind independent and things that are mind dependent is not fundamental. You can draw such a distinction wherever you want. <coughs> with artifacts on the mind-dependent or mind-independent side, but the distinction has no ontological significance. Dollar bills are as real as rocks. Eight, Descartes draws a distinction between inner and outer according to which each thinker has infallible access to an inner world, the world of experiences, known directly by inspection. The outer world is the world of physical objects, known indirectly by inference. On my view, this distinction is misdrawn. There is no inner transparent realm to which I have infallible access. Most of us are often mistaken about our own motivations. To say that we have inner lives, on my view, is to say that we engage in silent speech. This comparison of my views and Descartes mostly from the meditations, yields two dissimilar views of reality. The only thing that the pictures seem to have in common is that they both countenance a non-objective aspect to natural reality. For Descartes, it is the mind or soul. For me, it is the first-person perspective. On the, basis, on the basis of Descartes' meditations, it seems that Descartes holds that reality is not wholly objective. It seems obvious, doesn't it, that whereas material substances like physical objects are objective, thinking substances like minds are not. But maybe there's another interpretation of Descartes, one that would leave his ontology wholly objective. Does Descartes really take reality to include non-objective, finite, immaterial substances? Although I take the interpretation that I've just given of Descartes to be the standard interpretation, perhaps Descartes' first personal talk in the meditations is just a ladder that can be kicked away after we climb up it. Consider Bernard Williams' suggestion in his book, Descartes, The Project of Pure Inquiry. 
Williams imagines that Descartes is a pure inquirer, a truth gatherer, whose only desire is to maximize the truth ratio of his beliefs. Descartes, indefinitely well-informed and resourceful opponent, whose aim is to thwart Descartes in, Descartes in his pursuit of truth, is the fictitious evil demon. The evil demon gives rise to the, hype, to the hyperbolic of doubt that there may not be a physical world at all. Hyperbolical because it calls into question not only whether now I might be dreaming, but whether my present perception or my present perception is political, but whether any perception is political, whether there's any world out there. On Williams's view of Descartes, if we can get past this hyperbolical doubt then we can come to no truths about the world and our conceptions of the world that will not be systematically distorted or in error. This is so because Descartes takes it to be self-evident that if any of my perceptions are veridical, then they are caused by things outside of me that the perceptions are perceptions of. Once Descartes gets gets the certainty of his own existence and of the existence of a non-deceiving God in Meditations 3 and 4, he can count on the truth of his perceptions, his distinct, his clear and distinct ideas. The aim of the project of pure inquiry, Williams suggests, is knowledge of the world, knowledge of a reality, this is a quote from Williams, knowledge of reality that exists independently of any thought or experience knowledge of what there is anyway, end quote. Each of us has experiences of the world and of ways of conceptualizing that, which give rise to beliefs. Williams calls this all, all, all this together a person's representation of the world. Suppose that two people, A and B, have different representations of the world. In order to understand how A's and B's can re be represent representations of the same reality, we must stand back and form a larger conception of the world that constitutes A and B and their representations. Then we add person C and stand back again to include C and her representations with A and B and their representations. Suppose that we continue this process until we arrive at a conception that it contains all the people in the world and their, all their representations of the world. Call this conception the absolute conception. If we cannot form such an absolute conception, then, says Williams, we have no conception of reality which is there anyway. No conception of any object of which we have knowledge. According to Williams, Descartes was concerned with knowledge that physics uncovers or provokes. So if knowledge is possible at all, it now seems, the absolute conception must be possible too. That was a quote from Williams. But notice, the absolute conception has no place for anything whatever that is irreducibly first personal. Each person in his or her conception of the world is represented, but not from any personal point of view, or first personal point of view. The absolute conception is wholly objective, there's no place for a first-person perspective or for any first-person phenomena in the absolute conception. This raises the question, what happens to the soul in the absolute conception? If souls are omitted from the absolute conception, but Descartes is committed to them, then the absolute conception is metaphysically incomplete, well, from Descartes' point of view. Well, Descartes may even agree. The motivation for the absolute conception is to map out a terrain for, for a domain, to, sorry, is to map out a domain for knowledge that is produced by physics. But Descartes may, may think that there is no such knowledge of souls, that physics doesn't tell you about souls. William suggests something like this at the end of the book. That is, physics doesn't tell you about souls, therefore there are no souls. That could be that what that's could be what. Williams is thinking Descartes could be thinking that way, but he, maybe he's not. Moreover, Williams says that Descartes' interest was as much, in fact, more in science as it was in metaphysics. In this case, if the soul is not knowable scientifically, 
then there's no loss in leaving it out of the absolute conception. Recall, the point of the absolute conception is to have a conception of reality that is wholly independent of us. If a soul is private to each person, the absolute conception cannot be independent of us if it contains souls. So let us leave souls out of the absolute conception and return to Descartes' search for, for truth. Perhaps Descartes did not think that there are any truths about the soul since physics does not deliver any knowledge of the soul. It seems to me incoherent to say that souls exist, truths exist, but there are no truths about the soul. Wouldn't the sentence, there are souls, express a truth? I'm not committed to, the, the, to souls. In fact, I don't believe they're souls, but I don't see how you can be, um, you can think that souls exist, truths exist, but there are no truths about souls, such as souls exist. To say that there are, no, there are souls, but no truths about souls is tantamount simply to stipulating that there is no truth but physical truth. It seems more charitable to interpret Descartes' use of the first person as being only a stylistic cho choice, as Williams also suggests. It is a delicate question, Williams says, at what point the first personal bias in any methodologically significant way takes hold of Descartes' inquiry. The questions Descartes wants answered may just as well be of the form, what is true, what is known, rather than what can I know. <coughs> This is now me speaking again. Maybe so, but Descartes' method, the project of pure inquiry, still has a first personal structure. As William says, Descartes' method requires reflection, not just on the world, but on one's experience. So even if Descartes' goal is objective, his method remains first personal. If what is presupposed by the possibility of knowledge is the absolute conception, why does it matter how the absolute conception came to be formulated? The absolute conception itself has no tie at all to the first person. It is totally objective. Here's a mundane analogy. You walk it to the store to buy some milk. If the aim is to obtain milk, what difference does it make whether you walk, ride a bike, or take a taxi to the store? It's the milk that counts. Similarly, if there's a wholly objective absolute conception, what difference does it make whether the method to, to use to formulate it is, is not objective? If what counts is only the absolute conception, then Descartes' picture of the world, surprisingly, is wholly objective. Perhaps Descartes' position was like that of the, chem the chemist, Kekulé, who discovered the molecular structure of the benzene molecule, a hexagonal ring, while dozing in front of his fireplace in 1865. The point here is that how Kekulé came up with the idea of a hexagonal ring is irrelevant to whether that idea is correct. Similarly, if, if Williams is right, maybe Descartes' method of hyperbolical doubt is irrelevant to how the absolute conception should be regarded. Speaking for myself now, I do not think that Williams' interpretation of Descartes can succeed for the reason that I do not think that the absolute conception can be a complete description of reality, however anybody arrives at it. This is so because among the representations to be included in the absolute conception will be representations whose existence entails exemplifications of a robust first-person perspective. For example, suppose that I believe that I'm going to die young. Okay, too late for that, but just put that aside. This thought would appear in the, in the absolute conception as Lynn Baker believes that Lynn da Baker is going to die young. But that's not accurate. My belief is about my death, whoever I am. To be accurate, the absolute conception would be to represent my belief as Lynn Baker believes that she herself is going to die young. But to represent my thought in that accurate way would render the absolute conception not fully objective because Lynn Baker believes that she herself is going to die young entails that the robust first-person perspective is exemplified. If there were no robust first-person perspective, there could not be such a thought. 
So even disregarding Descartes' first personal method of arriving at the absolute <laughs> conception, on my view, the absolute conception could not be a complete ontology. In order to be a conception of what there is anyway, independently of any thought or experience, the absolute conception must leave out the dispositional property that is the, disp that is the first person perspective in its robust stage, <coughs> and hence, on my view, must be incomplete. So, e uh, yeah, so I am even further from Descartes if you align him to the absolute conception than I am on the standard interpretation of Descartes. Uh, conclusion. In conclusion, if any of the if if the if the standard view interpretation of Descartes is correct, and he agrees that there's a non-objective aspect to natural of natural reality, his uh, picture of reality is quite different from mine. Let me review some of the dis dissimilarities between a Cartesian approach and my approach. There is a first-person epistemic primacy for the Cartesian, but none for me. Language is individual for the Cartesian, but language is social for me. Thinkers are solitary beings for the Cartesian, but thinkers are social beings for me. Pure minds exist for the Cartesian, but no subpersonal mind souls or selves exist for me. The Cartesian endorses substance dualism, but I endorse an indefinitely broad pluralism. The Cartesian is committed to foundationalism, but I am committed to non-foundationalism. The Cartesian takes the distinction between what is there anyway and what depends on us, a mind-independent, mind-dependent distinction, to be fundamental. I do not. There is an immaterial inner realm for the Cartesian, but no such immaterial inner realm for me. There is an infallible method of inquiry for the Cartesian, but no infallible method of inquiry for me. To me, that's quite a significant list of differences. In short, while I affirm a robust first-person perspective, a capacity that sets mature persons apart from everything else in the world, my view is far from being Cartesian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Baker. Uh, this was not only a very dense and interesting uh, speech, but it was also on time. So we have plenty of time to discuss now. Uh, I think we have we can take at least from now to quarter to four, or maybe to take some more if the discussion goes goes on. Okay, who wants to start, Mario? There or from here? Or? I think it's there to come here. Oh, okay. Uh, Lina, as you know, I strongly sympathize with your Jung journal, and I think your proof that your kind of uh, your ontology or your philosophical views are very different from the characters uh, has been successful. Uh, I only have two brief sympathetic uh, doubts. Uh, that something I two ma minor points. Uh, also, I think you, your views are different from the cults, also from the point of view of res extensa, because he was kind of a strict physicalist for his own time, much more than you are. So that's something you could stress. Hmm? No, 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 about the cult. So he had this idea, you know, about causation. Uh, so you could say more about your difference from his, his uh, conception of the physical uh, real more than you mostly talk about the m mental real, but I think there are big differences also in the way he conceived causation in the uh, uh, natural world and these other things. So my two questions are this. First, just I don't understand that passing on six, page six when you say conclusive evidence oh. over, that's for a third line, of a robust first person perspective comes from the use of complex first person sentences like I wonder how I will die or I promise that I will stay with you. So let's assume that my friend Andrea now says I promise that I will stay with you. Now in what sense what he says is conclusive evidence? For whom? Not for me because you know it could be a robot. I strongly suspect it's not. That's so it's not conclusive. Of course it's not conclusive for him if he's a robot. So in what sense is conclusive, I don't understand it. 
Uh, if, he's a, if he's a robot and he does not have a first uh, I'm not saying that robots cannot have first person perspective. Oh, of course. He's a robot without. If, he, if he's a robot that does not have a first yeah. person perspective, he could not assert that. He could, just as your computer could say, um, I'm broken, or your computer can say, I, uh, your computer could say, I promise never, I promise that I'll never break on you. Um, the computer's not asserting it. So your, who's robot, your robot friend who is, does not have a robust first-person perspective okay. is not asserting any truth. So it's conclusive evidence for whom? It's conclusive. It's not conclusive evidence. It's conclusive evidence for me. For Valtras? I have a robust first-person perspective. But it's not conclusive evidence for anybody who doesn't have a robust first-person perspective because that person could not, it wouldn't be an assertion. That, that person couldn't assert it. That person could only, um, uh, but you, it, it produced the sounds okay. that sound like the English sentence, I promise that I will stay with you, but could not assert that he promises that he will stay with you. Uh, some, but, and it, it's, the he, it's the second occurrence of I that I think it makes it conclusive. Because in fact, if you, for simple sentences, there are lots of several um, philosophers like Lichtenberg and Peter Geach and other people say that the, the, the word I can be eliminated. Well, it can be in simple sentences like I am hungry, or I am sitting down, or I am good. It I can be. I, all that, Lynn, that has the same truth conditions as Lynn Baker is hungry, Lynn Baker is sitting down. But if you say, I wish I were sitting down, that second I is in the content of the thought. It's not just the thinker of the thought. The thinker of the thought could be referred to anyway. Like, you can, can refer to it you know, as the, the tallest person in the room is sitting down. You, can, you don't change the, the truth conditions or whatever else. Uh, but, uh, if, you, to, if you can find the I outside the content clause, but it's when you put the I in the content clause that you, then you have I as part of the content, and that's what you can't be, that's what requires a robust first person perspective. I, I don't understand in what sense this is conclusive evidence. Because let's assume I need it. I'm not convinced that I have a first person uh, point of view, uh, so perspective, and then I state the sentence, I wonder how I will die, and then I say, oh, now I have conclusive evidence. Oh, yeah. That's how they don't I think If I'm right, you, when you say, I wonder how I will die, you, Mario, say that, whether you think you have a first person perspective or not is irrelevant. That's the beauty of my view. It doesn't require you to think that. It just means that if my view is right, there's this dispositional property yeah, that's that you exemplify throughout your entire existence and you manifest by saying, I, I wonder how I'm going to die. That's a manifestation yeah. of the property. That's what makes it conclusive evidence, such as you're riding a bicycle. It's conclusive evidence that you can ride a bicycle, that you have the capacity, you know how to ride a bicycle. Yeah, but it's that's just like that. For yourself, for the same person. That's your point, right? Uh huh. The point is, my point is, okay. it's a theory. It's a theory of the first person, yes. and my theory okay. is not that you have to understand the theory or care about the theory or know about the theory at all. Okay, I, I would say more in private. I'm not in private with that. That's the last word on this. It's a little issue. The other one is, uh, I had two doubts, and I will be brief. Fundamentally, you have said only persons, that's your view that I share, only persons have a robust first-person perspective, and also all persons have robust yeah. first-person perspective. All persons have first-person perspectives, robust or rudimentary. Not all persons have robust, okay, but because you might, you might be, you might be a yeah. baby and you, you're a person, yeah. but you die, right? Okay, that, that's, that's no my point. No. Okay. So let's take someone who is, you know, an animalist. And it says, look, there is some specialist bias in your view. Because what about someone who has a disease that's such that he won't be able, this baby won't ever be able to acquire a robust first person view? So what you are only saying this is a person only because it belongs to a kind. Yes. A kind of and but then he says that's only a biological bias because so you have to say people with this DNA, whatever, these are persons. No, I don't want to say that at all. Yeah, but because you could have had this DNA before there was a language. You couldn't have, there couldn't be a person until there was a language that then could okay, uh, allow right. that self-concept. So what about but the baby who never has not the ability? Okay. But, that, but that does go back to kind. 
the, um, you, what's wrong, what is essential to you is being of a kind that typically acquires a first person perspective. Not that you have to do it, just as, just as you're of a kind of uh, you know, nationality that typically rides a bicycle. That's right, but you don't have to ride a bicycle to be of that kind. Yeah, but well, you wouldn't call that person a biker. I wouldn't, but I'd call that person a person. And I, but person yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the analogy is, if, uh, you know, Italians have a tendency to pay bribes. So let's assume that Roberto doesn't. You wouldn't call him a briber or an no, Italian. No, 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 I would, no, because, of, because that, that's a contingent property. Okay. Whereas having a first person perspective is, a, is an essential property and having a robust first person perspective is a typical way of, of having, of exemplifying this dispositional property of having a first person perspective. Typically, everybody, I said, you first. Every single individual in the world who is a person has a first person perspective from the beginning and of existence to the end. That first person perspective may be rudimentary and, that, and it may be robust. It's robust only if you get, if you get to the point where you have a, a language that allows you to formulate these complex thoughts. I think, I think actually, here's what, I, I must say I have certain Wittgensteinian sympathies. And one is that, one is that thought is dependent on language. But there, there are plenty of psychologists who think that too, so, yeah, that's, you know, that's good enough for me. Well, I don't even need that, but, I mean, you know, in terms of appeal to authority, I shouldn't, I feel like I shouldn't appeal to Wittgenstein, because she feels like Lisa Borowski, Okay, shall we gather two or three questions? Yeah, more, more sympathetic questions. <laughs> so we got three questions now. Over there? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the um, Descartes interpretation that you came up with at the end. Can you understand it? The, 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 the one with the Descartes interpretation. Speak slowly. The, the first one or the second? The first uh, one is oh. the stand. So regarding, so one point you were making, uh, quoting William, was uh, that the soul is in excluded from the absolute conception. I don't think that this is so, so I'm, I'm disagreeing with the interpretation, maybe you are disagreeing too. Uh, I think it can be excluded for, uh, by Descartes for two reasons. First, I mean, the meditations themselves should be part of the absolute conception, and they are they're making points regarding the soul. Maybe they, they, they are they're making claims that the soul has to be distinguished from the body. Okay, so that's, however, what is excluded is, or the only thing that is excluded is a strong, or what you say, a robust first person perspective. So Descartes, I, or Descartes self, and also the soul, I mean, normally it's not the soul, it's not anima, but normally it's man's, and, uh, or maybe it's sometimes even consciousness. So he doesn't use the, the, the word souls that frequently. But he uses it, uses it not as a strong first person perspective as we would use it today, but as the beginning of this kind of, or as something that goes against this skepticism. And there he draws on Augustine and he draws on Plotinus. And uh, so it has a purely epistemic foundation. And that, so it would be this, this self concept of the soul, I think that's that's something that he's simply not interested in. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't talk about the soul. That could be outside the okay. Okay, we definitely I think I have two I think I have two things to say about because I'm not too sure I understand what your question is. But one is people can talk about the soul all they want. And that can be in the absolute conception. For example, you're, if you believe there's phlogiston, that can be in the absolute conception. Your belief that there's phlogiston, it doesn't mean that uh, phlogiston is a property in, your absolute, in the absolute conception. It just means that there are these beliefs. So you can talk about it. You can talk about the soul. That's not a problem. That, I mean, that, that doesn't put the soul in your ontology any more than it would put phlogiston in your ontology. But, and the other one was, um, you said that he was just interested in the beginning, the consciousness. Yeah. No, no, that, right, yes. is that wrong? This was, I mean, this was a termino terminological con um, question, uh, remark. I mean, it's not, he's not so much talking about the soul, anima. He's focusing on man's mind and sometimes even on consciousness. And I think it is important because 
uh, if he's talking, if he's taking the first person perspective, then in your terms, it's not robust first person perspective includes, includes something like consciousness, it's only the general first person perspective. And that's only for epistemological reasons and not for reasons of self-consciousness. So that's something he's not just not interested in. But he talks about he talks about the the, the mind as a non-expanded immaterial subject. Right, yeah, yeah. Not, that's what I'm I'm, worried, I'm thinking of the meditations where he does talk about on I mean I'm, he does make ontological remarks like well, yeah. we have two kinds of substances besides God. We have two kinds of substances, two kinds of finite substances. Material substances which are extended and immaterial substances, i.e. souls, that are not extended. There are different there are substances, different kinds of substances. It's not just an epistemological problem, I don't think. But I could I don't know expert on Descartes, so maybe you know more about them. Okay, over there. Uh, thank you very much for your very uh, clear and I would say non-controversial uh, exposition here. So I would like to try to uh, maybe push us into more controversial uh, 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 area. You say that, uh, referencing Kripke as well, uh, it is impossible that two people have the same self-concept. So I wonder uh, if we sort of turn that around. So that is, uh, can one individuated organism with one uh, rudimentary first-person perspective manifest multiple uh, robust self-concepts, multiple uh, robust self-first-person perce uh, perceptions. And if yes, then I wonder, uh, do you conceive of that process as being a sort of purely empirical one, or would you say that there are more personalistic uh, goals and reasons that guide uh, that as a sort of higher-order process? I think I want to say no to the first question, and then I don't have to answer the second question. <laughs> So, but you can see from us, it's pretty a being like that. Right, I, I, well, that's very good. I don't think I don't think that that has to do with the first person perspective. I think that the first person perspective is a, is a formal concept. It has, it doesn't, it can have any kind of content, and of course, it, its content could be kind of a fragmented content, as in schizophrenia. Um, it's, it's, but it's a formal concept. This doesn't have. It's not qualitative. That's one way I differ from many, many. Uh, contemporary philosophers like David Lewis. You know, a, a person is just a bunch of properties, a bunch of qualities. Actually, since he's anonymous, he doesn't think of properties, but a, an individual is going to be... You can't have two qualitatively identical individuals, two qualitatively similar individuals. That's logically impossible for them. That's why the fission problem, that so stupid problem, is considered so important. It's only important because you have this presupposition that, you, that if you have um, one origin with two uh, offspring, the offspring could not both be. Uh, you have if you thought that if you thought that individuality in persons was determined by, say, psychological continuity and physical continuity, then you had two offsprings from one individual then you'd have a problem about uh, personal identity because then you'd say, oh, is it person A or person B? Oh, well, it can't be both because, of course it can't be both. But then that's, you wouldn't think that it could be both if you if you think that fishing is possible. I don't know, I know you aren't talking about fishing. No. But, but if you thought that fishing was possible, as in fact I think it is with twinning, with, with an embryo of twins, or you know, I don't know if it's a fetus by then, about two, two weeks, uh, it twins, then you do have offspring, uh, two offspring from a single source, which goes to show to me that you don't, you, sh you can't, you can't characterize or understand personal identity in terms of continuity. It just, that's, that's what I take it to mean. Other people take it to mean, oh, you have a big problem, now you have two, or you used to have one, and that's obviously impossible. Thank you. Another question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think my question is quite similar to Mari's one. I just wonder, um, you said that if a person has the capacity to develop a, a robust second or first person perspective, it can be considered a person. But if a person doesn't have this capacity at all, take for example the case of the severe autism, 
<laughs> the case of the severe autism or autism. 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 Okay. Uh, in this case, we have a person, uh, an entity, who has a, a, a not a robust first person perspective and doesn't have this capacity at all. In this case, it can be considered a person because it belongs to the kind that has this kind of capacity. But if the distinction is not get to the, through the presence or the absence of this capacity, so it became a biological difference. So that I can you just give me some clarification about this part? Yeah, what I what, what I think is that when when a fetus develops the capacity to um, support a rudimentary first-person perspective, that's when the person comes into existence. The person, of course, get, gets born, or not, of course, but gets born and maybe has a bad, very serious autism. Some people with autism apparently don't ever get robust first-person perspectives, but actually, I just did a paper on autism, uh, and, there, and many people who are considered non-verbal autistics can type and they can type and, con and they communicate by typing. Well, that to me is verbal. It's just not oral. You're not speaking, but you, that, you still have a robust first-person perspective. So number one, I'm not convinced that an autistic, no matter how bad the, the autism is, I'm not convinced that an autistic person can't not, cannot develop a, first per a robust first-person perspective. But number two, I think that since my, the way I think of ro robust and rudimentary first-person perspectives are, connected for per persons is that when a fetus develops a rudimentary first-person perspective, if it's a human fetus, the human fetus with that rudimentary first-person perspective comes a robust, uh, 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 the second order capacity to, robust, to, to develop a robust first-person perspective. The second order capacity is a capacity that's essential to the person, not to the fetus, the person. But it, it only it comes sort of piggybacked on the rudimentary first person perspective. So so if this person never actually ever did um, develop a first person perspective, robust first person perspective, which is all I guess possible, if it never did, she or he never did develop a robust first person perspective, I still would say it all all along it had the second order capacity to it had the capacity to develop the capacity. Of a robust first-person perspective, because it was a human, a human being constituted by an animal that had a rudimentary first-person perspective. So that's that's sort of how I, I agree that this uh, the, that there's a sort of a little jog in here. It's, it's the jog that makes it possible for us to be connected to the animal world, yet unique, ontologically unique, and that's really what I'm trying to get at. All of us, all of us, even people with autism, no matter how bad the autism is. I also have a question along these lines, but Elisabetta over there, she was asking a question. I would like to ask you a question about uh, uh, whether uh, the way in which uh, you, uh, you draw the distinction between uh, the two uh, stages of uh, the first person perspective could be defended, because I am strongly sympathetic with uh, this idea of, uh, idea of the distinction, but uh, my problem is whether it could be defended without uh, um, it is uh, um, buying uh, such a strong thesis about the relationship between uh, concepts on the one side and natural language. <laughs> It is the idea that uh, you can't, uh, uh, you can't uh, uh, master, uh, possess concepts without, uh, uh, without uh, mastering uh, uh, a public language. And uh, also, uh, I, I find the very uh, demanding uh, also the idea that uh, in order to have a self-consciousness and you compare having a robust first-person perspective with having uh, self-consciousness. I, I find very troublesome the idea that uh, you need uh, concepts to have uh, self-consciousness. Uh, one could uh, be sympathetic with your distinction and have, and have uh, problems in uh, exposing uh, 
uh, such a strong thesis about the relationship between the thought and the language and, co and self-consciousness and language and so what you could suggest uh, to one <laughs> like me for example who is sympathetic to your distinction but uh, would not like to uh, commit uh, oneself uh, with that, such a strong thesis well, is, is, this, is the strong thesis that you're referring to my idea that that thought is dependent on language, conceptual thought. I mean, well, for one, for one thing, um, uh, I do think that, and I, and I like that thesis. Um, and, I, and there's psychological evidence that if you give if you give a test to bilingual speakers, uh, say, say who speak say Hebrew and Arabic. And you give the test to bilingual speakers um, in one language, you get a different distribution of, uh, if the test is preferences and stuff, values and so on, uh, you, get a, you get a different distribution from if you give it in the other language. So, so this is, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember. This is, you can look, we can look it up in my book, but I forgot what it was. Um, that that there's some there's evidence I consider that evidence that there's that that the language language shapes thought that's what the that's what the psychologist said language shapes thought so I think that there's some evidence for that but even apart from that I don't see how a person in isolation could ever have conceptual thoughts that is thoughts like here's here's an example I did give once in a paper. I think the paper was called First, Ex First Person Externalism, I think was the name of the paper. And, and the idea was that if you were Robinson Crusoe and you hadn't had a language, you hadn't been brought up to have a language, but you were dropped on a desert island and you, and you started making sounds when you saw, this is a desert island, when you saw certain kinds of fish go by and the fish you, you made up shark, and it turns out there really are sharks in them. You, call, you make up shark, and now you see a dolphin, but you don't know it's a dolphin, and you say shark again. What makes it the case, now I think this is a Wittgensteinian point, what makes it the case that your concept is of shark, but you made a mistake with dolphins, or why not just say your concept is shark or dolphin? That is, your concept, you don't have any, you don't have any idea of natural kinds or anything like that, you're just, seeing these kinds of fish go around and you're and you're and you're late, you're not you're thinking you're identifying them or you maybe you're thinking you're identifying them, but anyway you utter shark and there's a shark you utter shark ten times there's a shark every time you utter shark the first ten times next time there's a dolphin and you say shark now to us that's a mistake because we have a concept of shark we have a concept of natural kinds but what would make it a mistake if you were just a Robinson Crusoe? Why wouldn't you just have a, a concept that's shark or dolphin? That is, and so you would have two different kinds of sharks, maybe, sharks and dolphins, but you would have only, um, uh, but you wouldn't be making any mistake because your, con your concept would be a disjunctive concept. What, what, would make it, what would make it wrong to say it's a disjunctive concept rather than a concept of sharks that you really made a mistake. Is that, does that answer your question? No, this is a Wittgensteinian uh, uh, argument, but I think that uh, a guy like Fodders, for example, uh, could uh, have uh, an answer to this uh, problem, and it is, uh, uh, for example, he could address uh, the uh, disjunction, disjunctive problem in terms of uh, the theory of uh, the asymmetric dependence, uh, for example. And so the problem is that, uh, I think that uh, uh, many people could object uh, to uh, this idea that you really need uh, a language uh, to possess concept. Of course, it, the, the problem of normativity, we, no, okay, okay, Wittgenstein has taught us uh, that you can't, uh, um, you can't account for normativity unless uh, you, uh, you place the concepts within uh, the, the, the common, the private, uh, um, Sorry, the public, uh, uh, private, uh, public uh, practices of using words, but uh, uh, of course, um, uh, 
person like Father Spoods uh, say you do not need uh, a language, you just need to have the, the right uh, tracking relations with uh, the, the, the property in yes. the world. Yeah. And that so, was my uh, one of my questions. Well, so, uh, maybe we could go on. <laughs> you what, what makes it the right tracking relations? What makes it the fact, the fact that you, let's say instead of saying sharp, you said blue, blue. And that for the and every time you said will it will turn out to be a shark. Next time you say will it turns out to be a dolphin. It's your tra what are you tracking? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just just to bring up to the point. Well, in order to see that I point to something, but I don't need to have a language or a concept. But I I see that I'm pointing to something. So. Uh, why do you say that in order to have a, uh, a self-awareness of thinking of yourself as yourself, you need a conceptual language? I find myself in front of the fire. I'm not saying I am sitting in front of the fire, but I'm there. You know I look at the fire, I know I'm not the fire. I'm not, I point at the fire, I can point at me and say, well, that, that's not the same thing. But I, uh, why do you need the language in order to, uh, to find out that you can, that you are oneself? Maybe you need, well, I won't say that you don't need the language, you need someone else. That's, that's, a, that's a different thing. Not, 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 you would, not that you need someone else speaking, but someone else which is not you. In that case, you see another robust first person perspective, which is looking at the fire. You don't have the same point of view, and then you understand that you are oneself distant from another oneself. I would say that the relationship is more original than language. That may be the Yes, there is another. Yeah, I want to follow up, and that's a bit more based on empirical literature. I mean, it's known that, for instance, kids with nine month, nine month old kids have something like what is called secondary intersubjectivity. So they can distinguish uh, someone else's emotions from their own emotion. Uh, they can uh, they have social referencing and all kinds of stuff. So it seems that they have some kind. They are on the way They're on road to robust mm -hmm. in, uh, to uh, robust first person perspective. And they are also able to pass the mirror test long not before. A, not at nine months. So no, 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 wait, that's a new thought. You're completely right. I'm not saying that they are doing this at nine months. But they're doing this. And that is something I think you would commit to expect that they use the first person pronoun in the right way before, before they pass the mirror test. But it's the other way around. And if language is... <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh -huh. That's strange. Maybe the other microphone would be better because yeah, that seems to be. Uh, so and that's something for us. You, you should expect just the other way around. And the first and the uh, regarding the first point you were making regarding thinking. Oh. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, regarding thinking and uh, language. Seven-month-old kids are able to distinguish between living and non-living objects, and they apparently, and that's not a perceptual distinction. It's no. not; it's a general distinction. So they seem to have a category that allows them to distinguish long before they have a language. So would you? How, how would you? But I think the, the more important point is that the empirical, uh, the evidence from developmental psychology goes against what you would be committed to expect that kids are able to recognize themselves as, they, as themselves before they develop relevant linguistic abilities. Actually, I, um, first of all, I don't want to hang too much on psychology, even though it's, I just did. And the reason I, I don't is I'm not. I, I mean, I, I think psychology is extremely fallible, and every now and then they change completely. Uh, but that's not neither here nor there. Take, take the, there are that is there is such thing as evidence in psychology, and here and one bit of evidence is um, Gordon Gallup's chimpanzee mirror test. You chimpanzees can be taught to, as he said, recognize themselves. That's what he said. He says he said it self. He he called it self consciousness. Um, but they can be taught to recognize themselves. It was a very clever experiment. The experiment was. First of all, when chimpanzees are just in the wild, or just in your lab, and you have a mirror, they 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 think of the uh, they they apparent they react to their image in the mirror as if it were a conspecific another chimpanzee. 
So if they're, so either they, they have a, I don't know which kind of reaction, but whatever reaction they would have to another chimpanzee. So he's trying to, he's trying to think, how can we get, what, how can we see whether or not a chimpanzee can think of itself as itself, or what I would say as itself. And so what he did was he anesthetized a bunch of chimpanzees, and he put a uh, little uh, blue and red, one, one on an ear, one on an eyebrow, and then they came it so they didn't, and it's odorless, there's odorless paint or whatever it was. Then they came out of the anesthesia and put them back in front of the mirror, and after a while they were going like this. That is, they were seeing themselves, or no, realizing it was themselves they were seeing in the mirror, and, but that doesn't mean they had self-consciousness, in my opinion. In my opinion, that means they could distinguish. Self-consciousness is a conceptual idea, not an idea of distinction. You can distinguish things. This, to distinguish things does not mean you have self-consciousness, unless you can understand what you're distinguishing, or understand that you're distinguishing. But that is but, I mean, that is almost trivial. I mean, if you say that self-consciousness or robust self-person uh, perspective is conceptual, then, of course, it, it comes out uh, obviously true that you need language. I mean, if oh, you okay. think that there is, oh, that there is a uh, oh. strong connection between concept use and language, or what would then be the... No, no, a lot of people, not me, but a lot of people like Chomsky and Fodor think that you have concepts without... Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So but that's not, I mean, so I'm not... It's not obvious. It's not obvious. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it wouldn't work for you. It works too much for me. <laughs> well, um, um, my question is a clarification question. Um, yeah. Would you like to say a few words about well, the distinction you made at page four between biological discontinuity and ontological discontinuity? Why? Why? Why do you think you have to call it a, a sort of super, super biological uh, dispositional property and not a biological property evolved from natural history of animals? Yes, of course, there, there has to be some biological discontinuity, but I know that for Darwin, the discontinuity between the insects and the animals before the insects were much greater than the one between, well, chimpanzee and uh, Human being. So why is this 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 discontinuity is ontological and not the other? Well, I, actually, but I think that's a good question. But I, I think that we I think that we are different from from chimpanzees, other primates. Primates. We are different because we have just incredibly different kinds of causal powers. We have causal powers to have wars, to have torture chambers, to have to have cities, to have government, to have chamber music, to have uh, uh, just, I mean, you can just, you just can't quit on our, we have causal powers that, that, that supersede, that go far beyond the causal powers of any other, any other living thing. And I think that those causal powers add up to a difference in, in kind. They're not, so we're not just sort of super monkey, super chimpanzees. But it could be that there are, it could be that there's also uh, biological continuity as well as ontological discontinuity, but I think I think that the the difference in causal powers is a huge, huge difference. That all the people who think oh, we're all just animals, I think they just what are they thinking? Are they thinking about their own real lives, uh, or for the lives they live, or the, the things they deal with? They uh, just read something. Uh, if you think that all if you, all of your uh, properties uh, uh, are internal or intrinsic. Just wait till something happens to your credit rating. You know, it's, it's not, it's, that's the world we live in. We live in a world where, there, where you worry about your credit rating. And what is that? Animals can't do that. Nothing can do that without a language. So I'm, that's why, why I go for language and I also go for um, externalism and I go for all the things that are sort of out of fashion. <laughs> uh, I, I have a very quick clarification point. Suppose that we land on a planet where you have human beings who have never developed beyond the rudimentary first-person perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it seems to me that you uh, draw the, the notion of a person from the robust first person perspective, and then you project it backwards to the rudimentary one. But what in, in, in the case where we never make an experience of the robust first person perspective, would they still be persons? No. No, I don't think so. And I think that may have been, that may be actually a phase of uh, uh, in evolution. That is, that, that as there's various kinds of, not homo sapiens, but various kinds of primates that seem to be different from chimpanzees before they, I think they, I think language comes on very gradually. So that people, I mean, not people, animals are both, can have what, rudimentary first person perspective before any language is developed and then they um, they s develop communicative I'm sure it's communicative language so, so first of all I can show you where I've hidden my food I can show you where the, the, the predators are hanging out I can you know we, we, we end up in fact there's a lot of speak of evidence a lot of evidence about cooperation which I'm not I'm not familiar with but there's a lot of it and so I think that there there, there were things like that there were social beings, primates, that then developed into things that could support first per robust first person perspectives. But if they can't support robust first person perspectives, even if they have rudimentary first person perspectives. And if they, even if they have a remote capacity, as you say, to develop such a perspective? I don't think they do have the remote capacity until actually. Well, if, if, you, if they are humans and they don't have. I'm not saying they're that. humans. I'm saying this is even before Homo sapiens. Okay. Okay. I forgot what they are. There's all the other Homo things. Okay, I, I think, well, thank you, Professor Baker, for the answer.